I'd like to start by being, being slightly controversial. I'm going to say that poetry is all about rules. I say it's controversial because, you know, nowadays, rules have got bad publicity. Even though you may agree with me that sometimes the rules are quite useful. <laughs> also, being French, I know for a fact that what's fun about rules is often to break them. Having said that, before we break the rules, we have to know what these rules are. Indeed, as the Dalai Lama said, know the rules well so you can break them effectively. Poetry, if you will, is a bit like football. Because you cannot play if there are no goalposts, players, or lines. So tonight, I'd like to introduce you to some rules of French poetry, so that at the end of the evening, you will be able to spot an Alexandrine on the Parisian underground. And I'd also like to introduce you to some French poetry players. Some of them set the rules and applied them. Some broke them, and there's even one poetic player who decided to do away with rules altogether. Uh, a quick word on quotes. Uh, sadly, there's not enough time uh, to, for me to translate in English uh, all the quotes. Having said that, don't worry, it's fine, because I want to put the emphasis tonight not so much on meaning, but on the melody, on the rhythm of French poetry. Now, I'm going to ask you to imagine you are in France. To be more precise, in the city of Toulouse, in the southwest of the country, uh, on the foothills of the Pyrenees, idyllic setting. It is 1943. And as you're walking down the street, the Gestapo stops you, arrests you, and throws you in jail. And there, you are given no pen and no paper. And yet, you suddenly feel an urge, a compulsion to write or to compose something. So my question to you is, what are you going to choose to compose or imagine or write? Any suggestion? Remember, you've got no paper and no pen. And you do feel this urge, this terribly painful urge to write something. Anybody? Fingernail. Sorry? Fingernail. You're going to write fingernail. Oh, I see. You're going to write with your fingernail. But what are you going to choose to write? Not what on, but what are you going to choose to write? Anybody? Okay. I will tell you what I would choose to write. I would choose to write poetry. Why is that? Any idea? Sorry? No? Well, because it is easier to remember than some other forms of writing. That's my choice anyway. The man we've just imagined is a real one. He's called Jean Cassou. <coughs> so as you can see, he was born in 1897 and he died in 1986. Um, he was raised, bo raised both in Spanish and French because one of his parents was of Spanish origin. Um, he was also quite politically active from a young age, especially in the socialist and communist uh, sphere. <coughs> then when the time came to work, uh, he worked for cultural institutions. And at the start of the Second World War, we find him as director of the Musée Moderne uh, Musée National d'Art Moderne in Paris. There he is part of a resistant network uh, in the city of Paris that helps um, stranded pilots and soldiers to escape back to safer grounds like the UK and also distributes propaganda for, for the Allies uh, around, around Paris and France. Then in early 1943, a close network to his gets rooted out and some of, some of the members get killed or sent to prison. So Jean Cassou decides to flee to Toulouse. And there, he's in his cell. He's been told he won't be given any uh, paper or pen. Uh, 
and he's going to spend one year in this jail. That he doesn't know at the start. And on his very first night, as he, 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 he recounts in his autobiography, uh, he chose, he decided, he had the search to write, and he chose poetry. The result came out uh, just a few months after he came out of jail in 1944. And that, that's the result. 33 sonnets composés au secret. So 33 sonnets composed in hiding. It seems a bit odd because Jean Cassou was already uh, quite a celebrated uh, uh, novelist. He published two novels already, plus a, quite a big number of articles, on, articles and columns on the art world and also politics. So why poems? Well, because, as we concluded, it is easier to remember. So now let's look at what makes it easier to remember poetry. First of all, you've got the shortness of the poetic line. You've got the rhyming, which helps with mnemonics. You've got also, in, uh, in some cases, you've got word repetition. And also, quite often, poets will use fixed forms. That means they have a recipe to, to fall back on, a number of lines they can use, uh, even the rhyming pattern sometimes. Also, in the case of French poetry, we have the all-important line structure. And in French, there are two main line structures, the octosyllable, which has eight syllables, and the alexandrin. The alexandrin dates from 1180. It first appeared in this book, Le Roman d'Alexandre, um, but it was popularized by a Joachim Dubelet and his friends in the 1550s. So despite appearing in 1180, after that, most, most poets were using the decasyllab, which is a 10-syllable line. However, since Joachim Dubelet, the Alexandrin <coughs> has become the most important, important poetic unit used in French poetry. So let's look at the Alexandrin in slightly more detail. The Alexandrin, as we, we've got an example here, two examples, two Alexandrines, taken from sonnet number no. nine uh, by Cassou, and I'm just going to read it. Laissez-moi maintenant repasser la poterne, fleur d'un ciel inversé, astre de ma caverne. So it might not appear obvious to uh, non-French speakers, so I've decided to split all the words into syllables, so you can see clearly that that they have only 12 syllables. And as I said before, my simile, stand, my simile stands, poetry is like football, especially the Alexandrine. Why am I saying that? Because a football pitch has two halves divided by the central line. And it is exactly the same with the Alexandrine or any other classical line in French poetry. That's an Alexandrine. The first half is the first hemistic. The second half is the hemistic number two. And they're both separated by the caesura. The caesura is not uh, just for show. It means that between syllable six and syllable seven, there mustn't be any word. Okay? <coughs> Sorry. So here, let's look at these two Alexandrines again. As you can see, after syllable six, on two occasions, there is no word. <coughs> so that's how you know that this is a classical Alexandrine or any other type of uh, line. Uh, it was like that in Roman d'Alexandre, the same with uh, Joachim Dubelet, the same with Jean Cassou, and if today you write a classical Alexandrine, it is the same. So now, let's take you to the Paris underground, where, up until, I think, the 70s, you could see this, this sign in the carriages, which says, Attention à la marche en descendant du train. Which means, uh, watch your step when you get off the train. And this, unknown to the, uh, the people who wrote it, is a classical Alexandrine. And at, you know, when you read poetry, when you're used to the rhythm of the Alexandrine, you, you see that like, like a red nose on somebody's face. It is, it is that obvious. So there you go. Now you are official Alexandrine spotters. <laughs> 
<coughs> Having said that, French poetry, French poetry is a bit more than just the Alexandrine. We've got also to count on um, rhymes. So as you know, rhymes is the repetition of a sound at the end of lines. And in French, as in English actually, there are different kinds of rhymes depending on the number of repeated sounds. So let's look at one example here. A very famous, um, uh, very famous quatrain that I'm sure most French people will recognize. Um, je suis le ténébreux, le veuf, l'inconsolé, le prince d'Aquitaine à la tour abolie. Ma seule étoile est morte et mon lutte constellée porte le soleil noir de la mélancolie. <coughs> so, line in, in this quatrain, line one and, and three rhyme on two sounds, L and E. Then these two, line two and four, on three sounds. And for instance, in French, this rhyme with at least three sounds is called a rime riche. In English, it's called an ornate rhyme. Now, beyond that, um, when lines are organized in a, a visual unit, like here, uh, or in stanzas, if you want, um, we've got different kinds. Uh, in this case here, what we have is a quatrain, comes from quatre, which means four. <coughs> this quatrain is the opening quatrain of a very famous poem by Gérard de Nerval. Here he is. <coughs> so as you can see from his date of birth and uh, the year he died, he was right in the middle of the Romantic period, which is important. Um, he got to fame thanks to his translation of Goethe's Faust. Even though apparently he was not good in German. So that gives us some hope uh, when you're a translator. <coughs> so obviously he tried to make a living, you know, one way or another, and one of these ways was uh, through journalism, which took him to different parts of Europe, as well as the Middle East, from which he wrote a number of very famous journals. Uh, so journalist, he was obviously a poet, and he was also a playwright. And it's in, cap in this capacity when he, he tried to... Um, to stage one of his plays, that he fell in love with uh, Jenny Collot, one of the actresses on stage. Uh, but obviously, like I said, you know, it was part of the rom romantic period, which means that the love affair could not work out. It had to go wrong. Actually, Jenny Collot never accepted his, his advances. Uh, she married a violinist and died two years later. Very romantic. And as a result of that and other things, Nerval had a first internment in an asylum uh, for a mental breakdown <coughs> in 1841. Even though some specialists say or claim that he showed signs of mental instability as soon as 1831. And again, this is important. So we saw uh, that look the, the Catherine just showed is the first of a poem called El Desdichado, which is the first poem in the very famous collection Les Chimères. And Les Chimères contains no less and no more than 12 sonnets, which, as you know, is like the syllables in an Alexandrian. Incidentally, all the sonnets in this collection are in Alexandrian. Then we saw that Jean Cassou wrote 33 sonnets composed in Haydn. What you don't know is that Joachim Dubelet wrote mainly three collections of poems, one called Olive, Les Antiquités de Rome, and the most famous of all, Les Regrets. So all in all, he wrote 338 poems, which are all sonnets. What does it mean? It means that these guys really like the sonnet. I like the sonnet. In fact, I would go as far as saying that the sonnet is the pele of French poetic forms. So let's look in a bit more detail at this pele of French poetic forms. And for that, I've chosen 
I'm sorry if I say famous too often, uh, that's the case. This is Joachim Dubelez, most famous sonnet. Um, and again, you know, most French people will know this thing almost by heart. So, heureux qui comme Ulysse a fait un beau voyage, ou comme Cestula qui conquit la toison, et puis est retourné, plein d'usage et maison, vivre entre ses parents le reste de son âge. Quand reverrai-je, hélas, de mon petit village fumer la cheminée Et en quelle saison reverrai-je le clos de ma pauvre maison qui m'est une province et beaucoup d'avantages Plus me plaît le séjour qu'on bâtit mes aïeux, que des palais romains le front audacieux. Plus que le marbre dur me plaît la voix de fine. Plus mon loir gaulois que le tibre latin. Plus mon petit liré que le mont palatin. Et plus que l'air marin, la douceur angélique. So as you can see, this is a typical sonnet, and it is made up of 14 lines, organized as follows, two quatrains, followed by two tercé, a tercé being a stanza of three lines. But probably more important than that <coughs> is the rhyming pattern. The rhyming pattern, as you can see, uh, the two quatrains work on two, two rhymes only, So you've got line one, four, five, and eight. And the middle ones are rhyme B, so on and so forth. So that's the typical rhyming pattern of a typical sonnet. This, it has to be said, is very different from the English or Shakespearean sonnet, as it is known, as we can see here. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna you know, damage this beautiful poem by reading it, uh, but as you can see, The structure of it is different because we have three quatrains followed by a couplet at the end. And also, look at the writing pattern. The quatrains don't work together. They, they seem to be separated. So, I will, I will not say anything on the English doing things differently. <laughs> no, no, no. I will not be drawn into that. What I will say is that the difference between the Shakespearean sonnet and the French sonnet are not small. Indeed, what the French sonnet emphasizes is imbalance, unevenness, a kind of out of kilterness, which, it has to be said, is extremely rare in poetry because poetry normally craves order and balance and harmony. And yet, The French sonnet is organized in a 4-4-3-3 pattern. <coughs> Besides, its rhyming pattern is quite slippery, as I'm going to try to show. We saw the quatrains are quite easy. It's A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A. But then you move on to the terce, and it all becomes a bit complicated. Because in terms of pure rhyming, what we have is a couplet, C, C, followed by a quatrain. The problem is, it is split in three, three. Which means that we have the couplet followed by you know, an isolated line, then move on to the next terce, which again has a couplet and another um, isolated line. What this means is, conflict is inherent in the French sonnet. The French sonnet is pulled two ways. There is always a lot of tension in it. And I think, along with a lot of other people, that this is part of the strong attraction that French poets and French readers find for the sonnet. Because of all this, or we, we've just seen, I think it's not surprising that Jean Cassou, Joachim Dubelet, or Gérard de Nerval chose the sonnet. Look at it this way. Jean Cassou was jailed for how long he didn't know. He had no knowledge of his fate. He didn't know if there was going to be a, a trial or a summary execution. He had no idea what was going to happen. Added to that was the fact that he was very worried about, about the fate of France in the war. Uh, it was still very much you know, in the balance and actually more <laughs> on the side of the Germans than the, the Allies because if I'm not mistaken, Could be. I think in 43 the states hadn't entered the fray yet. Um, as for Joachim Dubelet, well, uh, he was stuck in Rome 
when he wrote his famous collections of poems, a place he really didn't, li didn't like. Uh, he had gone there as the sidekick of his famous uncle, Jean du Bellay, who had been asked by the King of France to go to Rome to broker a peace agreement with the Pope. Because at the time, France was at war with about everybody, in, uh, everybody else in Europe. As for Gérard de Nerval, well, he was a madman. He was the man who walked his lobster at the end of a blue ribbon and said that he did so. Well, he liked lobsters because they don't bark. Uh, he's the one who went through a number of internments, which got longer and longer as time went on. And eventually, he's the one who ended up hanging himself in a small street in Paris. So what they have in common, these guys, is that they were, the three of them, were looking for order in an antagonizing and aggravating world. They wanted harmony while being confronted on almost all sides by disharmony. And they chose to write the, a sonnet, or sonnets. Another poet who liked the sonnet very much and wrote sonnets in somewhat aggravating circumstances is Félix Arler. In fact, Félix Arler is a bit more than that because he is the only poet in French history to have got to fame and who have remained famous thanks to just one poem. I mean, I don't know if French people have heard of Félix Arler, but normally nobody, nobody knows anything else he's written. That's the only one we remember. Uh, and in English, um, this sonnet is called uh, My Secret. So I'm going to read it in French. Um, Mon âme a son secret, ma vie a son mystère. Un amour éternel en un moment conçu. Le mal est sans espoir aussi, j'ai dû le taire. Et celle qui l'a fait n'en a jamais rien su. Hélas, j'aurais passé près d'elle inaperçue, toujours à ses côtés et pourtant solitaire. Et j'aurais jusqu'au bout fait mon temps sur la terre, n'osant rien demander et n'ayant rien reçu. Pour elle, quoi que Dieu l'ait faite douce et tendre, elle suit son chemin, distraite et sans entendre, se murmure d'amour et levé sur ses pas. À l'austère au devoir, pieusement fidèle, elle dira, disant ses vers tout remplis d'elle, « Quelle est donc cette femme ?» et ne comprendra pas. <coughs> so again, you know, he was born in 1806 and died in 1850, so keep in mind, he is very much a romantic. And like a number of French poets, he started by studying law. Uh, and that led him to work in a notary's office, where he got so bored uh, with his job and his boss got so bored with him that he quit pretty promptly and started writing for the stage. From that point on, he started leading a bit of a dandy existence and attended a number of literary salons, especially Charles Naudier's Salon de l'Arsenal. Why is that? Well, he liked the talks there, but especially he was infatuated with Charles Naudier's daughter. And as was standard practice at the time when you went to salons, and when you left, you had to leave uh, some kind of note or a good word or even a poem in the guest book. And my secret is what Felix Arver left one evening. So, so far, um, you know, it reads a bit like, well, it reads a lot like typical romantic fair. You know, a man madly in love with someone who doesn't love him back. But then, you, th there's a few clues in this point that not everything is as it seems. First, the rhyming pattern is slightly odd. Um, because what you have is two conflicting quatrains. We have A, B, A, B, followed by B, A, A, B. Not a lot, but it's a first clue. What you have to remember is that uh, Romanticism is not just about love and sadness. That's what a lot of people think. In Romanticism, there is also a lot of play and a lot of bite. So as often with the sonnet, it is in the couplet, so the first two lines of the terce, where the tension of the sonnet starts being resolved. It is where the message 
containing a quatrain is, <coughs> is reversed. So let's look at the second big clue that something is a bit uh, different. Quoique. Quoique in French means although. Okay? But it is also a very ugly word. It sounds very wrong to a French ear. And it is odd because we, you, you do notice it because the rest of the poem is extremely melodious. It's very nice. Quoique can also be pronounced quack. And uh, in French, as in English, quack is a duck's quack. <laughs> but worse than that, quack in French also means something that is not right. Then, third clue is distraite. Distraite can mean either of two things. It can mean distracted and absent minded, which is okay, but also scatterbrained and foolish. And that's less okay. And then the poem ends on comprendra pas, which, you know, after all we've seen so far, uh, can be understood as just she doesn't understand. Can also mean she cannot understand. She doesn't want to understand. And even she's a bit simple. <laughs> Are you not convinced by what I'm saying? In this case, I'm going to ask you to look at the acrostic in the first quatre. An acrostic being a poem or series of lines in which the first letters or words in each line form a name, a motto, a message when read in a sequence. So can someone spot the acrostic? No? What? Yes, mule. Mule. Okay? In English, mule. <laughs> so that is actually what kind of somewhat forces the reader um, to do a second reading of the text. Uh, because mule, again, is the animal. But more to the point, it is also a stubborn and pig-headed individual. So that's where the romantic bite comes in. So acrostics are a known tool of poetry. Uh, it is one cute way to convey a message stealthily or unstealthily because the reason we know about them is because somebody found them. Um, and I'm just going to give you uh, two examples I really like of acrostics. One, not from poetry, but from uh, another big influence on my life. <laughs> the Terminator. Yes, 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 yes. So one day, um, the governor of California sent a letter to some administration in the States. And here is the letter. I'm going to let you find the acrostic yourself. <laughs> yes, yes. That's Schwarzenegger. Yes. Who would have thought? Um, having said that, uh, I think... To me, the sweetest example of acrostic, and this time in poetry, uh, comes from two writers from the Romantic period. Uh, the first one is Alfred de Musset, a famous, sorry if I keep saying that, but a famous uh, French poet and playwright, and his then mistress, Georges Sand, who was a writer and a thinker. So one, one, one morning, afternoon, not quite sure. Uh, Alfred de Musset felt a bit horny. And he sent this letter to Georges Sand. Quand je mets à vos pieds un éternel hommage, voulez-vous qu'un instant je change de visage Vous avez capturé les sentiments d'un cœur que pour vous adorer forma le créateur. Je vous chéris, amour, mais ma plume en délire couche sur le papier ce que je n'ose dire. Avec soin de mes vers, lisez les premiers mots. Vous saurez quel remède apporter à mes mots. So basically, he's writing this little poem, and in the last two lines, he's asking Georges Sand to look at the acrostic in the text. And this acrostic is this. Quand voulez-vous que je couche avec vous? Which means, when do you want me to sleep with you? Okay, that, that's quite cute. Quite nice. But actually, the best of all comes from 
George Sand's reply. Her reply is this. C'est un signe faveur que votre cœur réclame, nuit à ma renommée et répugne à mon âme. Which roughly translated means, this awful favor you are asking of me stains my reputation and is disgusting to my soul. <laughs> so you would think, yeah, it's not going too well for, uh, for Musset. But actually, if you apply je, uh, Alfred de Musset's technique, what, you, what she actually says is set nuit which means tonight. Okay, so how about that for erotic banter? <coughs> right. Acrostics are a kind of soft landing in the land of fun and gameplay. They are soft landing in the land of the Messies and Ronaldos of French poetry. <coughs> Because before you break the rules, you can actually toy and play with them. So we're just going to see quickly a few of you know, a few ways to play with the, 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 the rules of classical poetry. One of them is internal rhymes. And the example I've chosen comes from this gentleman, <coughs> Paul Valéry, a very influential poet and thinker and playwright from the first half of the 20th century. So, um, the example I'm giving is this. Uh, it is an extract from a poem entitled La Fileuse, <coughs> which means the spinning lass. And I'm going to read it. Le songe se dévide avec une paresse angélique et sans cesse au doux fuseau crédule, la chevelure ondule au gré de la caresse. So what's really interesting with this, this tercet is this. So in green, you've got the rhymes, and in blue, another rhyme. What's, what's really interesting is that Line one and three rhyme with the hemistic of line two, and line two rhymes with the hemistic of line three. So what's so special about it? Well, apart from, from this terse sounding amazing when you read it, uh, it is also, what, what's fascinating is that Valéry mimicked with sounds, or mirrored with the sounds, the action of the spinning lass. The spinning lass is weaving. She's intermingling, she's, you know, she's doing these things with phrase. And that, that's the same thing that Valéry is doing with sounds. Having said that, so that's an example I really like, so that's why I wanted to talk about it. But when you talk about poetic play, for me and for many people, the king is Raymond Queneau. Here it is. Raymond Queneau was born in 1903 and died in 1976 the year I was born. He was also an asthmatic, like me. Unlike me, he was the husband of André Breton's first wife's sister. And very much unlike me, he was also a polymath of genius. He was, you know, a playwright, a poet, and a novelist. So far, so good. But he was also an actor, a mathematician, a philosopher, a film critic, an inventor, a journalist, an editor, a linguist, a translator, so on and so forth. One of the things he invented is something that he called Neo-French. Neo-French, he understood uh, what he wanted to do with Neo-French was write French the way it is spoken or the way it is heard. That was quite a revolution, which actually didn't work, but he did try. And the best example of that comes from the first page of his most famous uh, novel called Zazie dans le métro. So here is Zazie, because the, the book was turned into a film by Louis Mal in 1960. And that's the example of Neo-French that she comes up with on, on that first page. D'où qui pue donc temps? And you know, in a novel, uh, you read a novel, you, know, you, don't, you don't read it out, you read it. And when you come across that word, as a French person, you wonder, what is that? It doesn't look French at all, it's, it's very odd. And the only way to make sense of it is actually to read it aloud. Because then it becomes clear, d'où qu'il pue donc temps, means, d'où qu'il pue donc temps. That's the way it should be, it should be written, which means, where does, where does this thing so much from? So, 
neo French, with neo French, what he wanted to do was strip written French of the unnecessary. To come back to poetry, which is the subject of tonight, uh, we have a great example. I mean, you know, you find hundreds of thousands of examples of play uh, in Queneau's poetry, and that's one of them. Échappera au méfait de la putréfiante femelle. So you might, I don't know, from my reading, you might have understood that this is a perfectly classical Alexandrian. Well, even though it doesn't look it. So what happens here? Well, the original and properly written French version is this. Échappera au méfait de la putréfiante femelle. But this is a 15-syllable line, and he's writing a poem with Alexandrine. So what he, he decides to do is just chop off the E's to make it into a proper, a real proper Alexandrine. Okay? Um, <coughs> and funny enough, it is also the way we speak it. You know, when most French people speak, they're not going to say, échapperas au méfait de la putréfiante femelle. We're going to say something closer to échappera au méfait de la putréfiante femelle. So, an Alexandrine. <coughs> Another thing he invented in 1960 is the ULIPO. You've heard of it. Uh, ULIPO stands for Ouvroir de Littérature Potentielle. And it's a group of like-minded people, uh, writers, mathematicians, physicists, philosophers, who just gathered to create... Uh, rules or techniques to, to write, to, to generate a text. <coughs> and one of these techniques, invented by <laughs> no less than Queneau, uh, is S plus 7. S plus 7 means that you take a text, you spot the nouns or substantives, hence the, the S, and you take a dictionary and you count seven nouns down from that one, and you replace them. So, Kuno, uh, it's not clear, I understand. Um, Kuno applied this rule to nothing less than Gérard de Nerva's most famous poem, El Desdichado, and that's the first line. Je suis le ténébreux, le verre la consolé. And in his particular dictionary, the seventh uh, noun down from ténébreux was tensoriel and so on and so forth. So, je suis le tensoriel, le vieux, l'inconsommé. <coughs> and, funny enough, I can't help seeing um, a strong link between Queneau and what he did to, uh, to traditional rules and uh, the Charlie Hebdo spirit, which is quite ironical. Um, another thing that uh, he wrote, amongst many other, is a book called A Hundred Thousand Billion Poems. So don't worry, it's actually quite simple. What he did was write 10 sonnets, what else? One per page, and then he separated physically each uh, line, as you can see here. Okay? That means that if you mix and match you know, the, the different threads, there's 10 to the power of 14 possible poems or sonnets. So uh, this book is actually the, um, the birthmark. Oh, birthmark? Yeah. Anyway, uh, it's the first time that combinatorial literature uh, started. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there you go, 100,000 billion poems. So these are only a tiny, very tiny fraction of the ways, you know, uh, people, poets, can, can play and toy with the rules. Uh, but enough of playing. I'd like now to do some serious breaking. And in terms of breaking, uh, we have two main contenders. We have prose poetry, as we can see here. So when you look at it, uh, it's more like a big, long paragraph. Uh, could be in a novel. That's prose poetry. And there is also Free verse poetry. I'm not going to read them. Um, but the first example, so the, the example of uh, prose poetry uh, is from this man, André Breton. So born in 96 and died in uh, 66. And he started not in law, 
but as a medical doctor. And actually, during uh, World War I, he was sent to um, an asylum uh, to treat soldiers who, uh, who got a bit mad and deranged at the front. And there, to his surprise, uh, in the ravings and the monologues of his patients, as well as uh, in, in the dialogues he had with them, um, he discovered the beauty of the unconscious. So the conscious, you might have guessed where it's going, you know. Breton is the man who brought Freud into the literary sphere. And actually he used, for writing, a technique used by Freud himself to treat his patients, and that is automatic writing. It's very fun, you should, you should give it a go. It, it is fun to, uh, to try automatic writing. And it led, in uh, 1919, if I'm not mistaken, to the publication of Les Champs Magnétiques, Magnetic Films, uh, which he co-wrote with his friend Philippe Soupeau. In Les, Les Champs Magnétiques, what these two gentlemen did was write as fast as they could so that they could bypass consciousness. So why would you do that? Because they wanted to access the unconscious, which for them represented the true self, the true individual. So after that, uh, Breton and his friends invented lots of games, um, which led to uh, you know, different texts, including the question game. And I'm going to play that with you now. So, uh, yeah. is somebody here called Elizabeth? <coughs> Caroline? Um, Ruth? <laughs> it's a, oh, Ruth. Okay. <laughs> so, I would like you to think in your head of an answer starting in it is. And you tell me when, when you've got it. An answer starting in it is. Ah, don't say it. Oh, oh. oh yeah. Right, again. Uh, again, again. Uh, <laughs> I think it should be a thing. Whatever. It's just it is and whatever. Okay. Yeah? Okay. So, what is your answer, please? What is it? You, I can tell you. Now. Yes, now, yes, yes. I'm ready to hear it. It is the Mekong River. Okay, so your answer is answering this question. <laughs> That's it. That is the question game invented by André Breton. <coughs> so thanks for that, Ruth. I'm very grateful. Um, so, you know, um, he worked a few more years as a, as a doctor and a, as a writer, and in 1924, um, he published a book called the Manifesto of Surrealism, uh, which effectively founded Surrealism as a movement. Surrealism is an extremely important uh, movement in the history of French poetry and also English poetry, actually. Um, but not just that. It went beyond just words because lots of uh, painters, lots of artists, went through the ranks of Surrealism. Actually, most of the famous European painters from the... 1910s, 1920s, uh, belonged at some point to Surrealism. So I'm thinking of Magritte, for instance, uh, Salvador Dali, but there's Max Ernst, there's Picasso, you know, so on and so forth. And what's interesting with Surrealism is that it actually didn't stop at the arts. It's gone into the mainstream because nowadays, you know, advertising uses Surrealism a lot to get uh, its message across. As we can see here, <laughs> so the, uh, the first advert here is for WWF and to me it, is, it got this, its inspiration from Magritte, it's pretty clear a man morphing into a fish uh, whereas the second is a Volkswagen advert for I I its very efficient engine and that's obviously taken from uh, Salvador Dali Now, um, I'd like to go back to the free verse poetry I, I mentioned shortly uh, uh, before. 
Sorry. Um, the example we saw was written by this gentleman. This is not a poem. This is a name. Willem Albert Vlosnir Apolinari de Vaj Kostolinsky, also known for his friends as Guillaume Apollinaire. 1880, 1918, which means that if I, if I had been Apollinaire, I'd be dead by now. Um, so Apollinaire, what can I say about Apollinaire? Apollinaire is a wonderful, wonderful poet. In fact, in my book, I nicknamed him the perfect poet. But again, he was more than that. He was also an extremely influential art critic. He is the man who discovered and named the art movement Orphism. He is also the man who recognized, was the first to recognize the importance of Futurism, an Italian and Russian art movement from the uh, early 1910s. And he is also, strangely enough, the one who coined the term Surrealism to describe uh, one of his plays from the, again, early 10s. A word that was, you know, taken up by Breton 14 years later. Beyond how great his poems are, what's interesting about Apollinaire is that he stands at a turning point, a major turning point in the history of poetry. And Zone, the, uh, the text I showed you earlier, is the best example of that. Zone is several pages long. Okay, so this is just the start. Uh, it is, Zone is also the opening poem of Alcohol, one of Apollinaire's two extremely famous and celebrated uh, collections of poems. And as soon as Alcohol came out, this text, uh, Zone, became the de facto manifesto of modernist poetry. Why? Well, because it is free verse poetry. That means that there is a very uneven number of syllables in each line. Uh, for instance, line three, I counted, has got 16 syllables, and the penultimate line has got 20. So he throws the rules out the window. What results from that is an extreme lack of melody and of rhythm, which is shocking to the ear of someone who's used to classical poetry. So it is quite a statement of intent by Apollinaire. And yet, he does not to tradition. As you can see, uh, we have lines. So it looks a bit like, like poetry, even though the syllables are not respected. Um, there are also stanzas. The first three lines are, are you know, separated, but then we have a terce, and we have a, a six-line unit after that. So again, you know that there's links with the, with the past. And, of course, there's also the rhyming. The whole poem, which is, I think, six, seven pages long, is rhyming uh, in an A-A-B-B-C-C pattern. This ambiguity I've, I've just talked about towards classical prosody is even better represented in the first line of the text, and more precisely in the last word of the first line. Why is that? Because if you choose to, write, to read ancien in a classical way, it's going to be three, uh, three syllables, en, si, un. That means that the first line is an Alexandrine. À la fin, tu es là de ce monde ancien. Perfect Alexandrine, you know, two hemistics, one says you're out, no problem. But then if you read it like French is spoken, like modernist poetry is supposed to be, you're going to read it like we speak, en sien, two syllables. That means that th that first line becomes an 11-syllable uh, line, which is very early. <coughs> so what Apollinia did there was basically ask the reader to, uh, to take sides. So yes, zone is extremely pivotal in the history of poetry because it acknowledges past traditions plays with them and breaks away from them with free verse. And also, the poem itself ends on the very future of poetry. Because its last line is this. <coughs> 
soleil cou coupé. Which is an extremely disturbing. The whole poem has been quite disturbing to uh, somebody who's used to normal poetry in 1913. But this, this is a real shock to the system. Nothing in the poem beforehand, you know, announced, uh, gave us any clue that it was going to end like that. Soleil Coucoupé, if you want, is to poetry what um, Fountain by Marcel Duchamp was to the arts. You know, in 1917, Marcel Duchamp walked into a shop, bought a urinal, signed it, and exhibited it in an art gallery. The question, it's a seminal gesture and a seminal question which has been bugging the art world, art philosopher ever since. And that question is, what is art? Well, in poetry, with Soleil Coucoupé, Apollinaire did exactly the same. He asked, what is poetry? Because of the lack of capital letter of any punctuation in this very odd uh, line, you know, he's asking us to, again, take sides on how to read it. Are we supposed to read it like football bloody hell? Or is it an early example of exquisite corpse, a surrealist game invented 10 years later by uh, Breton? You know, it's, it's all up in the air. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> um, having said that, Apollinaire's exploration of the limits of poetry doesn't stop there. First, he wrote quite a lot of erotic, some would even say pornographic poetry, which I'm not going to quote here, but uh, please go online if you want to check. <laughs> but more to the point, uh, he published in 1918 the extremely important, another one, a uh, collection of poems called Calligram. <coughs> a calligram, so the, the, the collection Calligram doesn't contain just Calligram, actually. There's only a third of Calligram. But a Calligram is a poem structure, a poem technique, invented by Apollinaire. And I'm going to show you what it looks like. This is it. A Calligram is words arranged on a page so as to form a shape or a pattern. So as you can see here, we have a woman with a hat. Um, but probably more famous is that, la cravate et la montre. So a kind of tie and a, and a watch. So I say this is extremely important because Zone was important in asking the question, what is poetry? And here he renews this question in a very novel way. Because what he does with Caligram is blur the boundaries between two areas of the art world which before had been completely disconnected. And these areas are poetry, or the written word, and the visual arts. <coughs> okay, so now I'm moving on to um, a poet who went beyond breaking uh, because he went beyond the rules. And this poet who is another amazing poet and man, is Aimé Césaire. So Aimé Césaire, born in 1913, which is the year my grand was born, as well as Albert Camus. And he died, you know, not long ago, in 2008. Césaire was a great and influential poet. Uh, with his friend Léopold Sédar Senghor, who was to become the president of Senegal, uh, he founded the movement, La Negritude, which is very important in terms of uh, um, black identity, black poetry. But actually, he's even he is even more of an influential politician. In fact, I would say that he is the Mandela of French politics. <coughs> um, he, st he, was a, he was a very gifted student, and uh, he got a scholarship to study in Paris at uh, Lycée Louis Le Grand, uh, and then at l'École Normale Supérieure. And at the end of the 1930s, he went back to, to Martinique, where he, he worked as a teacher in a, in a high school. But pretty quickly, um, he became the mayor of Fort de France, uh, the capital of, of the island. Yeah, sorry, I haven't said he's from Martinique, uh, an island in the French West Indies. Uh, and he also became a member of parliament for his island. 
And in this capacity, in this double capacity, he worked tirelessly to protect Martinique from two main dangers. The first danger was that Martinique remained a colony of the French colonial empire. And the second, which might be surprising, is that he wanted to protect Martinique from gaining independence. If you want to know more about that, you'll have to read my book. Um, but basically, I said he worked tirelessly for that, and in 1946, so actually pretty quickly after he got into uh, politics, he managed to regal Martinique's way the status of département. Département is an administrative ent uh, entity uh, that means that Martinique was exactly on a par with Paris, with Normandy, Bretagne, etc. It meant that Martinique had obligations towards France, but more importantly, it had rights. <coughs> so I'm not going to go on and on about his, his politics. Um, but, you know, I will, I will finish with... Um, what I still think is his defining poem, um, collection of poems, it is just a very long poem, uh, that he wrote when he was still a student in Paris. And this text is called Le Cahier d'un Retour au Pays Natal, which is an utterly beyond words poem. And uh, I've decided, because it's quite a long extra, so I've decided to put it in English for, for those of you who don't uh, speak or understand French. And I'm going to read it in French. Um, here it goes. Au bout du petit matin. Va-t'en, lui disais-je, gueule de flic, gueule de vache. Va-t'en, je déteste les larbins de l'ordre et les hannetons de l'espérance. Va-t'en, mauvais gris-gris, punaise de moignon. Puis, je me tournais vers des paradis pour lui et les siens perdus. Plus calme que la face d'une femme qui ment. Et là Bercé par les effluves d'une pensée jamais lasse, je nourrissais le vent. Je délassais les monstres et j'entendais monter de l'autre côté du désastre un fleuve de tourterelles et de trèfles de la savane que je porte toujours dans mes profondeurs, à hauteur inverse du vingtième étage des maisons les plus insolentes et par précaution contre la force putréfiante des ambiances crépusculaires, arpentées nuit et jour d'un sacré soleil vénérien. Au bout du petit matin, bourgeonnant danse, frêle les Antilles qui ont faim. Les Antilles grêlées de petites véroles, les Antilles dynamitées d'alcool, échouées dans la boue de cette baie, dans la poussière de cette ville sinistrement échouée. So here it is, that's the start, the opening of this landmark of a text, that is um, Cahier d'un retour pays natal. Now, I said at the start that poetry is all about rules. Of course, poetry is not rules. Poetry is what exists thanks to and beyond the rules. But still, I want to stick to what I said, which I agree is somewhat problematic in the case of someone like Césaire, because it is poetry without rules. So how can I flip this contradiction back together? Well, I can do that by saying that there are actually rules even when there are no rules. And that's what is so fascinating and enriching with Césaire. Because despite not using known rules, he creates his own idiosyncratic ones. And this we can see with the third paragraph of the extract I just, I just read. So again, you know, from the outside, looking at it, uh, it's just a paragraph. Okay. But then you start digging a bit, looking a bit more details, and especially you start listening to what you're reading. And then you realize the amount of echoes, uh, the amount of internal rhyming there is, and you see that there are actually a lot of rules. So I've put colors for your know, different things. Um, alliteration, there's a lot of alliterations, which become obvious when, when you read it. Uh, there's word repetitions with anti, you know, it's a kind of, uh, uh, this really, it's almost like a wave comes back and back. Anti, the word anti, is pervasive in the Cahier d'Arthur Natal, along with other words. 
Um, and then you've got échoué, which is, I'm not quite sure to say that in English, it's a chiasma in French. Échoué starts a unit, and another échoué finishes the other unit, so it embraces it, sticks it together. Um, so, as you can see, there's a lot of things going on in this text. So, I said poetry was all about rules. And again, I stick to it, because whether they come from the rule book, or they're made up as the poet goes along, rules always find a way in poetry. And to a certain extent, I'd like to say that that's what defines poetry, and French poetry in particular. And on an, you know, an aside, I'd say that it's nowhere truer than in today's musical world, <coughs> and especially in the case of slam poetry. As for me and poetry, well, intellectually speaking, I am a bit of an anarchist. And as Julie said earlier, my PhD thesis was on the concept of randomness or chance. So I do enjoy what you know, brings disorder. And yet, when it comes to poetry, I use classical prosody. I use classical roots. I write almost only Alexandrines. And I am partial to a sonnet as well. When it comes to poetry, what I did was actually follow Virginia Woolf's advice to a young poet who sent her a letter asking what he should write. She said, try anything you like until you're 30. And that's what I did. I mean, honestly, in my 20s, I tried every possible kind of poetry. I tried to make up rules. I mean, I've experimented a lot. And all of it is just awful. But still, and then I reached 30 or thereabouts. And, you know, naturally, without even thinking about it, I, I was drawn back to classical prosody, just because I like the rhythm. I like the melody. It's, it's something I need. Um, and I do feel uh, that my poetry um, gains from that. Um, which is not to say that you've got to talk, you've got to write like a poet in, uh, in the 19th century. You can, you can use words from today using classical prosody. That's not a problem. So now, uh, my wife um, complains a lot that I never promote myself. So I've decided to, uh, to please her this time. And I'm going to leave you with the uh, address of my blog, my poetry blog, which is Fichtre la belle idée. Dot wordpress.com if you want to take a look uh, I'm not saying anything so don't worry um, and just as a, a last aside uh, Fichtre la belle idée is taken from a great poem by Raymond Queneau so on that note I'd like to uh, thank you very much for coming and I'm going to wish you a very happy 2015 in which I hope you will read a lot of French poetry thank you very much Um, are there questions? I mean, yeah. I mean, if anybody's got questions, uh, probably won't be able to answer, but you can try. Uh, <laughs> feel free. Uh, yeah. Just a very quick one. Would you call um, French classical theater, which is a lot of it is in Alexandrian and yeah. Rhymes poetry? <laughs> That's a tricky one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> uh, well, you, yeah, you have to. You have to. Uh, if we apply the rule of uh, what I said, in that poetry is rules. Uh, you have to. And it is also true that you know some extracts from Racine, Corneille uh, do sound very nice um, and are, are poetic in their own ways. Um, so, but you're right. Your question raises an interesting one. It is. Um, that you can also write uh, Alexandrines, which are not poetry. Uh -huh. So that complexifies matters a little. Um, and that's actually what Kuno did quite a bit you know, with his friends at the Ulipo. Uh, they came up with weird rules, which meant that they did write some kind of poetry, but you got to be from the 25th century to think it is poetry, really. So, yeah. yeah.
Anyway, did you did you miss the English translation of, of these uh, texts or not? No? Okay, cool. Oh. But uh, yeah, the, the, the subject of you know translating poetry is, uh, is very interesting. Uh, I'm a translator myself, um, and I, I would never go anywhere near a poem. It's, uh, it's, it's incredible. It's incredibly hard. Um, so I am very admirative of, of people who translate poetry. But you have to say as well that it's, it's always, uh, even though you can be a fantastic translator, you're always going to lose so much when you translate. And that's also why it's quite problematic to, to show translations, because you cannot really give a good impression of a poem in, in a foreign language. Obviously, we have to have translations, because otherwise, uh, you know, French poetry would just remain within, with French people, and that would be a complete shame. Um, uh, it's the same for, for English, you know, I mean, we have to know where they are, but yes, Knowing the language helps a lot to appreciate the complexity, uh, the subtlety of, of poetry.